Come the beginning of the season, I wonder what the odds would have been on three Italian teams making three European finals. I suppose I'll have to ask Eva next time. Maybe you'll be able to find me a decent bookie. Welcome to the Anglo-Italian pod. As always, my name is Rory and I'm joined by my very good friend, Adam! Hey Rory, it's a bit of a weird one today because we're actually recording on a Friday compared to our usual slot on a Thursday, but it does mean we can actually cover all of the semi-finals properly and give our guests and viewers and podcast listeners a good kind of variation in terms of our views. Uh, But more importantly, mate, how have you been? I am pretty good. Um, This week has been a long one. Since the semi-final on Tuesday, which now feels like a year ago, I've been sleep deprived ever since. Being 33 (laughs) years old, I was talking to some students about it today, actually, and I was like, I'm not 21 anymore, you know. Like, when I do a night out, it does take me a week to recover. I feel like I'm just catching up on my sleep now. So it's been a pretty long, tough week, but absolutely worth it of course to be in that stadium we're going to talk about it i have Definitely. i can't wait to talk about it i've not really been able yeah. to talk about it yet so really looking forward to that how was your week mate you had a big week yourself right I have, i've also had a very big week uh it involved obviously on wednesday night traveling all the way to manchester and uh boy <laughs> was i treated <laughs> was i treated though was i treated that was an incredible game um, like yourself, very much sleep de- deprived even on the Thursday because, as I told you offline, mm-hmm. there was not a lot of sleep. It has to be said. I think yeah. I calculated Maggie Thatcher style esque like <laughs> sleeping. I think it was four <laughs> hours, maybe if I'm lucky. Um, but nonetheless, it was an incredible experience, which I cannot wait to relive with you as well. More importantly, nice. because no one has really seen the scenes that I got mm. from that experience, and I will be doing definitely a vlog for our channel. So. If anyone's curious, they can see it live as well. But let's nice. Let's I think it. there's a there's like a fundamental difference here. Like Definitely. Adam was really he stuck to the brief, recorded everything, <laughs> took it all in. I got distracted by various substances, and now I can't really. I took a few photos, and I was like, "Woo, let's go!" Um, it was a very good evening. So maybe no vlog, but I'll tell you what I can remember. But <laughs> the rest of the show, um, we will, of course, as Adam um, kind of signaled, we'll be talking about the Europa League, the Cool Kids Club. We'll be talking about the even cooler Kids Club in the Conference League. Lots of goals, lots of action. Yes some very good teams to look forward to some very big finals i'm really excited about all of these finals honestly i think they've all got their own little niches and then Mm. of course we'll be talking a little bit about the man we mentioned in the intro as we'll be talking about ivan tony in a big week for the fa the premier league and how we feel about hypocrisy maybe and then we will finish up with as we always do the weekend preview talking about the games that you'll be watching today this afternoon as you're listening to this um we'll be previewing them of course in both premier league and Serie A. so without any time to waste let's go we will see you for the european review after this very quick break Here we are. It's time for the European review. And of course, we're going to start in the Champions League. Now, mm-hmm. me and Andy have me and Andy, oh, me and Adam oh. have flipped a coin and we're starting in Milan first. Yeah. Um, we're gonna start with the Milan Derby, of course. Now, I was pre-game, I was talking to Tommy and we were on the metro and we were like down in some beers because Tommy was like super nervous and imagine, a bit yeah. overexcited. And we were down in some beers, and I was like, Tommy, there are 1.5 million people who live in this city, right? Let's say an estimate 800,000 people want Mm -hmm. to be in the final, right? They're interested in football. We are one of the 80,000 people that are going to be in this stadium. Like we, I think it just hit me how lucky we were and how fortunate we'd been to get tickets. So as always, we made our way to the ground, to San Siro. We got off at Lotto, so you can make a little walk because the station at San Siro would have been a complete mess. Um, Yeah. There for an hour, few more beers, met a few friends, and then you really felt the tension was building and building and building. And mm. it was we saw the team buses go past, everyone was screaming, shouting at the team buses, and it the whole city there was just mopeds beeping, like the, the atmosphere mm. was just flying. So then we looked at the tickets and we were like, Oh, wait, we we're not sat together. We were like, fuck, oh, right, wow. we've not looked. 
it was two of us separate, so two, two, two and two, right? We're like, oh, shit, right, okay. together. This is annoying. And then, so me and Tommy went together, and then our two mates went together, and then we got to the gate, and it turns out Tommy was on his own, right? We were meant to be oh, three wow. and one. So I was like, oh, shit, Tommy. Like, and Tommy, with it being your wafer, it was like, you can't fuck about. You have to go through the yeah. gate, right? So we were like, okay, fine. I ran to the gate and got in. Now, I'm sorry, UEFA, but we managed to sleuth past all of your gates, etc. Because this guy we went with, Nespo, right? I don't know if you've ever seen this. A person give directions around a stadium. He was like, oh, if you okay. take this stairway, turn left, and then go up to the first bit, turn right. And he gave Tommy exact directions how to get from one part, like literally one corner to the opposite corner. Okay. So we all ended up together by some miracle. I lost everyone in the melee of like two, two, <laughs> three, one. Somehow we managed to find each other in the bar in San Siro in one of the towers. We all met each other. We got together. Nice. Now I'm pretty sure the beer was non-alcoholic. I'm pretty sure it was. Mm. But by that point, we'd had enough that it didn't really matter. I think it was like the, <laughs> the placebo <laughs> effect of like, yeah, this is just making me drunker. Yeah. Um, so we had a few beers and then we were like, this has to be a good omen, right? The fact yeah. that we were we were supposed to be separate, now we're together. This has to be a good omen, and it was. It just yeah. was. It it felt like as the game kicked off. I don't think I sat down for the entire ninety minutes. I think it was just yeah, that's good. sheer nerves. It was sheer nerves and screaming and shouting and just. It's the best atmosphere I've ever witnessed in my life. Mm. It was like the 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 singing solo intro before kickoff. The everyone screaming the champions, which always gets me. Like the atmosphere was just insane. And then after the game, I was what I saw a few things on Twitter. And everyone was like, "Oh, what a terrible game! That was the worst semi final in history. Awful game, awful game." Honestly, I couldn't. Care. I didn't notice. Yeah. I just thought it was such a tense affair <laughs> that yes. every kick was gripping. Like yes. every single kick was like just the world mattered everything mattered on mm. that and i think i'm now going to stop and just give you the chance of what did it <laughs> how did it come across on tv because i saw mika richards and Thierry Henry like just in mind blown at the atmosphere and yeah. then give me your impressions of the game as well <clears throat> but atmosphere first let's do it atmosphere first i thought it looks incredible like we knew that inter fans would put on a show um yeah. But it did look mesmeric. It looks incredible. You could sense even when the obviously the broadcasters are doing their bit before kickoff and they're kind of on the pitch side and they were struggling to kind of like be listened and be heard as, as well at times because it was that loud the atmosphere. So I can sense like the players if they were nervous, they were definitely going to feel it by the time they got on that pitch because it felt like it was that just kind of cauldron atmosphere, should mm -hmm. we say, and. Yeah, obviously we'll talk about the contrast that it was compared to the Man City game in terms of atmosphere. But <laughs> I think there, there's elements where I can definitely allude to in terms of there was that kind of tense atmosphere. There was definitely it felt like that, and um, it was it was great to watch. It was certainly great. And as soon as you score, well, I say you, but it's into that scored, right? Yeah, yeah. You sense that it's kind of relief, but they just knew that was it. That, that was, was game over. That literally. 20 minutes afterwards, 15 minutes afterwards was just a party. It yeah. was just, we're here now. Like, and it was basically all of us just turning around to strangers and going, non ci credo. Non -ci like, I don't believe it. I don't believe <laughs> yeah. that. Non ci credo. Non ci credo. And it was like the game where I've hugged the most strangers in my life. It was just everybody. <laughs> like, it was that moment when the goal went in was incredible. But the, if we start from the beginning of the game, I feel like Milan came out quite quick. I feel like, which I expected, mm -hmm. they kind of, it felt like they were going to score. I was like, I felt like Inter started a little okay. bit slowly. Milan really came for it. But there was a big moment where Onana made the save. And I think it was, I can't remember who the shot Diaz, was from. Diaz. Yeah. And it was a really, yeah. it was a good save. It was a very good save, actually, because he got down yeah. very quickly. But the way the Inter fans were like, we all were just like, yes, when he saved it, because it was mm. like, we knew a goal at that point would be huge. Yeah. And I think from that moment, the Inter players just went, okay, right, we're here now. Mm. Like, we've, that's the wake up call. We have yeah. to make sure that we don't like, we don't let them in again. And yeah. I honestly think it was pretty comfortable for Inter. I think, I thought so, yeah. Some of the football Inter were playing, some of the moves were mm. absolutely beautiful. The little yeah. one, two passes, the little flicks, it was, 
I think we we kept counting how many passes it took Inter to get from Onana to the front. And it was like three passes, four passes, yeah. five passes. They were just straight through Milan every single time. And it was just ding, 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 ding. Mm. Lightning fast. And I thought, what? That is good cup football. That is good yeah, cup yeah, football. Solid defensively, but precise when you go forward. Yeah. And I think from that, from the my whole impression of the game was just Milan didn't even put a glove on in there, really. And I think Milan fans I've talked to in uh, since have just been like, we did not turn up for either game. We helped Inter, but Inter looked bloody good. And I just think it was super comfortable. Um, did you get the same impression? Like, and were you impressed by Inter's performance? Yeah, I, I think so. On the course of the game, I mean, there was only one or two chances that Milan had. And I think yeah. the only other kind of opportunity that I would say is clear cut was Liao. In the second half, yeah. where he kind of just managed to kind of screw his shot a bit wide. I think he didn't get the perfect placement on his shot yeah. at that time. But if that goes in, I think the dynamics slightly change in favour of yes. Milan then at that very moment. I didn't feel like Milan really knew what to do. And I think there was a contribution by Acherbi's kind of man marking of Giroud that really made it critical because they struggled like getting it beyond sort of that midfield area. And I think the other point that was really cleverly made was around Benacer and the fact that he was missing because I think yeah. had he been on a pitch, you're probably saying that midfield intricate passing that you mentioned probably isn't going to be as intricate. And it it's getting broken been, up a lot yeah, quicker, I think. Yeah. Exactly. So I think there's probably that aspect. But I also felt that defensively, Milan were a bit, wanting at times like we, mm -hmm. we kind of noticed it in the first leg right with Kier and Tamori and the way they kind of established themselves but again they kind of struggled to get a grip of it like there's certain parts where they were almost paying maybe too much respect because mm -hmm. I think they kind of expected you know if we get involved in that tackle does that make it a yellow card offense and they didn't want that for example yeah, yeah, yeah. so there was opportunities there where I felt like right Milan probably didn't know what to do and I think the ultimate thing, and we kind of called it on Monday night show, was about Pioli. He, he kind of lacks ideas, I felt. Like, even yeah. though I think there's an argument to say that the bench wasn't as strong as Inter's bench, for example, mm -hmm. because if you look at Mikitarian coming off and then Brozovic comes on in his place, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a that's, difference That too. is bloody good strength in depth. That's yes, incredible. exactly. Yeah. And you compare that to De Ketele, you yeah. know, Origi, for example, they haven't got the same strength, have they, really? No. So from that no. point of view, I, I was going to put this question to you. I mean, how did you feel as the game went on? Did you feel like Milan were ever going to kind of change it up? Or did it just feel like it was on TV where it just looks like purely didn't have an idea and was really reliant on his players to do the job? Yeah, it felt like if there was going to be a change, it would come from the, the like, I don't know if this sounds obvious, but it would come from the player on the pitch, not from on the mm. bed. Like, it would be divine intervention or a moment of brilliance that would get Milan back into it, not some tactical tweak or some change of persona. And I think as the game went on, it did get more comfortable. Obviously, you're still nervous because it's a Champions League semi-final and you're like, please don't yeah. fuck this up. But as the game went on, it was more just like, oh, this isn't going to happen. Like, if this is all they've got, then we're fine. And, like, that is all they had. And we talked about it with Dev on um, mm, Monday. Yeah. Like, they didn't have that focal point, that, that like, threat and that big threat up front that was going to just, like, smash it into the net yeah. off the tiniest sniff. Like, they just haven't got that. And a not fully fit layout was just not able to, to have the impact. And from, I think, the first moment he came onto the pitch, I was like, oh, he's, he's not. He's not fully fit. Mm. He's not going to be. He's not going to like. He's not going to do this. The only reason he got that re that chance was because Darmian slipped over and left him wide open. Yeah. If you know what I mean. And I think at that point, Leao, fair play to him, on it like a whip it and absolutely there. But I feel like he just he lacked that sharpness and obviously wasn't completely fit. So yeah. I think yeah, Milan just never looked like they were ever going to really um, come up with anything. And I think mm. Inter have really proven how pragmatic and how clinical they can be and mm -hmm. i think they're a team that now there's like you know pride comes before a fall and there's a lot of english media at the moment talking about the city's name is on the trophy and this is the easiest final in champions league history yeah. i've seen all sorts of wild takes yeah. on a team that won the scudetto two years ago um with a lot of the same players they are very good in, in cup competitions and let's not forget they're the only team that beat Napoli in Serie A when it mattered, right? Yeah. 
when Napoli needed to win, Inter turned up and did them one nil. Yeah, like so. I think this is a team that you cannot take lightly. And we again were joking in the stadium that there's the potential that Oasis songs could be sung forever in the San Siro <laughs> if, there is, if there is an upset. Um, if there's an upset in the final, I think they've already got the uh, Noel Gallagher songs planned in the Cordova. So people were trying to, were trying to kind of get them going a little bit um, from his comments. Mm. If you've not seen them, um, his comments of, we want Inter in the final because they're the worst team. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so is I interesting think... because after mm. the Man City game at midnight, as I was traveling back, he kind of changed his tune on that. He kind yeah, of went, funny that. yeah, funny that, gave a lot more respect to Inter. I think he probably saw them the night before and went, yeah. hmm, actually, then maybe, yeah, maybe this might out, be a bit closer. Yeah, and I think they they genuinely, like, obviously, we're going to talk about the final closer to the time and preview sure. it and see what, what form the teams are in. But in a more general kind of sense, I can definitely see Inter frustrating them. And, yeah. like... I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility and I don't think no, it's no. as ridiculous a claim as the English media would have you think at this point. No, of course. Um, of course. They are a very, but very dangerous team. I wanted to ask you this question because it kind of was something that I thought about the Man City match. Was there a certain player that on the day surprised you or maybe you underrated up until you saw them live in the flesh? Um, because I'll, I'll, mm. I'll put, I'll let you kind of ask me that yeah. question when it comes to the Man City match. But certainly, I grew an appreciation of certain players. Um, okay, but just curious about your kind of opinions in this particular matchup. Um, I think maybe I've seen him a few times, but I think in this game in particular, I would say a Cherby. Mm -hmm. I would we do say like him, he don't had, we? <laughs> yeah, because I honestly thought he was bang average at Lazio, and I thought yeah. I'm not sure why. In I know he was free, but I still thought it was a bit of a strange yeah. deal. But I think seeing him in this game, I appreciated his his reading of the game. I think was very good. His mm. ability to like man mark, as you said before, his man marking was incredible. And I think I just appreciated him a bit more as a defender. And I think it was just a really standout performance where I was like, okay. Yeah, no, this guy, and I know he's had a good season in general. Like he's been pretty solid for Inter, but again, it's the first time I've looked at him and watched him properly. I think, yeah. um, and I was like, yeah, I, I was really, really impressed by him. Um, and Chalonoglu, every time I watch him, I'm like, this yeah. guy's just a, a, a pleasure to watch. But I know that on his day, he can be a cre incredible. He happens to choose his day every time he's against Milan. I think he like yeah. really, 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 really hates them, and I get it completely. Yeah. They've said some horrific things about him, so I think. It really, um, yeah, I think those would be the two that come to mind. Like, not because mm -hmm. Barella, I've seen plenty of times and realized just how bloody good he is. And Lautaro, just the touches that guy takes. It's oh. just, and it was again when I saw him against Sassuolo when he came off the bench, just the rise in level straight yeah. away. You're like, oh, yeah, this guy is just next level. <laughs> like, <laughs> but they're the kind of headliners, right? So I say, yeah, Cherby yeah. and, um, Achebe and Chalia for the, uh, mm. the kind of under the radar performances, but yeah, I think that was it really. Um, disappointed honestly, by Milan, what? by the way. Sorry, disappointed by ben Milan in the way very. they played it. Yeah, very. I think I was talking to a Milan fan today, and they were saying that they just think Pioli's run out of run out of time, mm. run out of ideas, and I think in the kind of drunken haze of Tuesday night, an, an idea kind of hit me, and I was like, I don't know if. Pioli was supposed to be this successful. I yes, think he was he supposed to be day, a yeah. transition. I think he was supposed to be a transition manager. He was supposed to be a, yeah. a manager that got them back into Europe and then, yeah. you know, we'll go and get someone else. And then he won the league <laughs> and they were like, oh, <laughs> yeah. right, we've got to keep him now. And which is like, he won the league. Milan played yeah. fantastic football. He did a great job. But I think the board knew that he was only going to ever take them so far mm. or this football would only get ever get them so far. And I think it's kind of, they didn't see him being this successful. And now they're in a, a, a situation where they're like, okay, we're going to have to sack him, but he did win us the league. So I think mm. it's kind of, yeah, he's overachieved massively. Um, all the Milan fans want De Zerbi, obviously. I don't think it's going to happen, but I don't think Pioli is going to be in charge next year. I just think the, these two legs, it was really disappointing, the performances. To not get one goal, yeah. Um, mm. to only have a few clear-cut chances, and arguably Inter could have won by more than one on Tuesday, let alone on the Wednesday the week before. Yeah. Like It could have been a lot more comfortable. So I think mm. these last two performances have really put the nail in his coffin, as far as the fans are concerned, at least. I think the board are probably agreeing. Um, mm. were you, how, like Milan, we, we expected more aggression, at least, right? A bit more fight. Yeah, I think I was expecting a bit more 
clear-cut opportunity, shall we say. I thought they'd mm. just bombard the box a bit more and maybe yeah, yeah. if they needed to resort to like Route 1 style football, then that's probably what they could have done just to mix mm. it up a bit occasionally. I think the impression we got was they just stuck to a plan that has always been yeah. the case and nothing really changed from that plan. So, yeah, it just stunk of like... He, he's got no ideas of how to transition mm. this kind of squad at the moment. He doesn't seem to have a clue. And this is the kind of arguments we've always had about him, especially when it comes to the Milan derbies, right? He's never really kind of conquered those. I don't think yeah, if yeah. he needs, it feels like he needs influential players like Zlatan to be on the pitch to really make a difference. Yeah. And I think because of that, they just really were lacking. Um, but it's interesting because a month ago, you wouldn't have said that. You would have said... No. Liao on fire. They conquered Napoli twice, both league and in the cup competition. So therefore, they were the favourites potential on paper because we didn't see Inter's kind of run of form thereafter. <laughs> Just insanity, so, honestly. Yeah, and the problem for Milan now is that they have to go and qualify for Europe now. They have to go and qualify yeah. for Champions League. Like Inter... They have to do the same, but they're coming off a big old bounce here and they'll just be like, yeah. right, let's just have it. This season's going to be fantastic. Whereas Milan is like, right, let's salvage something from this season mm. now. It needs to be, there needs to be something to show for it. So I think, yeah, two teams in a very different psychological place. And mm. you can kind of tell in Milan who supports who by how they're walking down the street. It is that clear, honestly. It is that clear. But we're going to leave the Euro uh, derby there for now. I am mm -hmm. going to put some pictures on our Instagram um, from the stadium and stuff. I'll pick the ones mm -hmm. where I don't look too, my eyes aren't too bad. Um, <laughs> and I'll put them on the Instagram so you can see what it was like. I'll put a few videos yeah. up as well. It's just been a very busy week. Um, mm -hmm. But we are going to move up north all the way yeah. to the north of England and talk about Manchester City taking on Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. Wow, where to yeah. even begin? Talk us through the day, get in there, and then we'll talk about that exhibition. Yeah, so I think I'll start my kind of journey, like kind of going up to the Etihad. And I feel like, so obviously I was going up with a mate who's a Man City season ticket holder. Okay. Uh, just for context, he's seen them when they were at the worst in mm -hmm. the old Division 1, as it used to be. Playing Labels crew, Alex. League, yeah, yeah, yeah. League 1. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I reminded him about the time that Wickham did the double that season as well. So, nice. yeah, that was nice. Um, but, yeah, you could sense he was kind of nervous because he didn't kind of, like, some maybe people thought it was, like, a foregone conclusion, I feel. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone kind of saw that performance happening prior to kickoff either. And what was interesting was outside the grounds, there was definitely a kind of tension, but walking it as you're going into the Etihad, because it's kind of a, like a village s kind of feel going into that stadium. You could hear the crowds. They're getting really behind this Man City team. Even as you go through the gates and you're like, obviously in, on the concourse, getting your drinks and whatnot. And that we had a few, it was just kind of really nice and relaxed, but there was always that kind of sense of respect for Real because they knew what was going to potentially happen. Everyone kind of were giving themselves up for, uh, you know, there'll be a phase of play where it's against the run. They'll use their wingers like Rodrigo and Vinicius Jr. And then it will end up at the back of the net at some point. And I think there was always that air of caution. So I think... To see how that kind of, and we'll go into it in a bit, but just to see how they kind of never gave them an opportunity mm -hmm. really yeah. was it, so fascinating. And, uh, uh, you know, seeing it live was amazing. So to, I don't know what it was like at home to even watch it, but, you know, it felt like this was the most complete performance I've ever seen, like anyone do another side. And I think the other context is, such a pre prestigious team like Real Madrid. I mean, <laughs> they don't not, lose yeah. like this. And I think what's also lost in the narrative is Courtois had to do three worldy saves as well in the process. So they could have been even worse in terms of goal scoring line. And we'll allude to Real Madrid and how they set up as well. Because I thought Ancelotti got him badly wrong. Got yeah, him yeah, massively yeah. wrong. Um, yeah. But yeah, atmosphere-wise by all accounts from asking my friends, that was the loudest they've ever been this okay. season. So again, when I'm comparing it to the Inter Milan scenes, obviously probably a bit mellow in comparison. Yeah, but... I think it's, 
but it the, is the typical yeah. English atmosphere. And it's I think English it, atmosphere, yeah. English atmosphere, and I think to add to it, I think there was a lot of tourists. There was a lot of day trippers. Of course. Yeah, me yeah. included. Being yeah, there, yeah. It was one of those that was, I think, the, largely everyone was helping that city side to kind of conquer, and they didn't really need it towards the end. Yeah. I think that kind of first goal settles the nerves, second one goes in, and I'll talk about half time because I think half time you could sense that whilst the fans were really grateful to be in that position and they said that was an incredible half of football, they always knew that there was yeah. always a potential for Real Madrid. If they score well, one, that's it, basically. Well, this is it. So when it when they went 2 0 up, the missus turned around to me and she was like, Oh, well, Real Madrid aren't coming back now. And I was like, Well, they did come back against City last year with two minutes left when there was yeah. a two goal difference or something. I was like, yeah. They're like, You never ever know. So I could understand the nerves there. But I think if we talk about the first half, I think I was just really, really, and it's for the whole game, I suppose, really, really surprised by just how comfortable it was. It was mm. just. Yeah, I thought it was one of those things the Arsenal fan inside me was like, oh, okay, I don't feel that bad about losing the league now. This <laughs> no, lot not fucking now, class. Not <laughs> like, this lot are unbelievable. I was like, if they're playing Real Madrid off the park to this level, where, as you said, Courtois has kept them in the game and they're still mm -hmm. two goals up, like, it felt like, yeah, one of the best. I always go to, you know, do you remember the Champions League final where Barcelona beat Manchester United? Was it the 4 It wasn't, was it 4 0? No. 3 0 or something like that. 3 0. Messi got about the header. Messi scored, yeah. Yeah, Messi got the header. That's always my reference point of the greatest team performance I've ever seen, mm. right? That's always my, like, that is the best football yeah. I've ever seen played by a team in my life. Yeah, yeah. This City performance came close to it. And it's the closest I've seen to that level of performance where I was like, mm. wow, this is just... Like, on that night, no matter who it is, they were going to lose and they were going to lose badly. And it was going to be to some of the most beautiful football I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm very, very jealous you were in the stadium to see that, I'll be honest, because it must have yeah. felt like you were watching the Harlem Globetrotters, but it actually mattered, right? Well, I got, I got to a point where of, like, you're, you're more than welcome to come again, basically. It was that kind of vibes, because I, I doubt it was anything to do with me, but it was You can come vibes. again, okay, sweet. You can yeah, come yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, I've never seen football that kind of same pressure, same kind of intensity, and they dealt with it incredibly. And I think the testament to that, that squad is, at full time, I could not name you a player on the Man City team that played badly, like no, or no, didn't no, no, play no. to their strength, if that makes sense. There was no yeah. one that I would have said was below a seven yeah. or like yeah. an eight. Oh, they really could have done better. Yeah. There's yeah. always one player you kind of go, oh, yeah. you know. And I think maybe, potentially, Maybe people will say John Stones lost a few sloppy passes, mm. for example, and was being a bit too intricate. But actually, on the whole, he was incredible as well. He's, I felt like his pressure the season in the first he's half having as well. Jesus, just the season incredible he's in that having. role. Yeah, just incredible. And the, the one player that I wasn't anticipating to have as big a game was Bernardo Silva. And boy, did he switch <laughs> it's it off. Weird one, eh? Just it's a weird one. Because the first leg, he, he he was just almost like he was overdoing it. He was a trying mm. too hard. And then in the second one, just this game alone, he just seemed to exploit Camavinga so many times, mm -hmm. but also come on the inside. He was almost like that little annoying little player, like he can't get back that quickly and still yeah, be on my yeah. toes. How has yeah, he managed yeah. to do yeah. that? Yeah. Like, and he was just all <laughs> over the place. Um, so from that point of view, he was incredible. And obviously he got man of a match. Um, yeah. But I think... For me, the ones that I was really like blown. Yeah. So away. who's the who's Go the on. player like you asked me? Who's the player that you were like, okay, now I appreciate yeah. how good that guy is. So this is going to be another one, a bit like your Cherby, but Manuel Akanji. Yeah. Manuel Akanji, and uh, I've always felt like Man City needed that left back, but he kind of made it look like it didn't really need to happen. Yeah. He made, yeah. and I think what what the Man City fans around us were saying and all agreeing was. Jack Grealish does a hell of a lot of like running, backtracking. And I think that doesn't necessarily get picked up on TV as much, but his kind of work up in that kind of third really helps to reduce the kind of exploitation. And I, you saw in during the match, and I don't know if this was ever picked up during the duration of the game, but 
Rodrigo kind of swaps side. He's touching on the yeah, by yeah, lines. Yeah, 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 He's yeah. just trying to come on the inside. He comes inside. And even when they kind of rotated certain players, so you had at times Modric kind of dropped in. You had Crows kind of come in. They, neither of them kind of could work it out. They couldn't exploit no. it because the problem was as soon as like the likes of Rodri got involved, he'd break up the ball, get past to a Kanju or, for example, someone else. They would just do intricate free touch passes. That was it. Boom. Already yeah. gone. It's a bit like your analogy with Inter. Free passes, yeah, yeah. you're already in the final third. And that's what happened. I mean, Valverde, I couldn't tell you if he was on the pitch. I did not yeah, see him yeah, on the yeah, pitch. Yeah. That was yeah. the kind of thing. And I think this is the other point is Ancelotti got it massively wrong in terms of, I think Rodrigo, uh, Rudiger even, sorry, should have been playing. Should have started. I don't get why he wasn't playing after he did such a good job with Haaland. I don't well, get why exactly. he wasn't playing. And we all said before kickoff, he's a player that you don't want to play against. But if he's on your side, you love him to be in that first eleven because he ruffles the opposition, yeah, gets him into, people up and, winds yeah. people up, and that's he's a weirdo. Of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a weirdo. He, he unsettles people, right? He I does. Think. He does. But he does it brilliantly, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. he somehow manages to get away from not having a yellow card as well. Yeah. Um, but he, it's just that was part of it, and also the fact that I think a bit like the purely aspect, to Ancelotti seemed to. Act, like to to an extent, I think really, just really rely on the experienced heads, like to really do the job. Mm -hmm. And they obviously yeah. struggled with just the onslaught of Man City's kind of pressure. And the player that was most disappointed at was Benzema. Everyone yeah, raised about anonymous, Benzema. Eh? It was very anonymous, anonymous. But yeah. I think what I suppose I don't know if it's arrogance on his part, but he kind of sits in that middle bit kind of drags himself into offside positions, then pulls himself just onside at those crucial moments when the attacks kind of start to look like they're going to happen. But he doesn't really run that much. And I don't know no. if that's him conserving himself because he's at that age or, you know, in this particular match, he just couldn't get going. And yeah, I don't, he doesn't... It doesn't strike me as like my impression of Benzema has never been that he's like doing the pressing and the running and the he's just he appears yeah. somewhere and then scores <laughs> and you're like all right that's what he does yeah. so I think yeah it doesn't surprise me to hear that I just think when Real were unable to create chances for him as well there's not a yeah. lot he does beyond that so then yeah you're basically playing with ten men at that point right and it just becomes yeah a bit of a, a bit of a hole I think yeah it was a strange one and you look at the Real Madrid team and they are very old. Like yeah, the yeah, the, the crux of that team, like Cruz and Modric and Benzema, and a lot of them that is going to be the last, possibly the last time they play together in a Champions League semi final, or the Who last knows? time they play for Who Real knows? Madrid in a Champions League semi final. Like, I think there's going to be a lot of change. We know that Real Madrid are like bringing in Bellingham and they're going to throw a lot of money around, right? So, mm -hmm. I think a few of them could be not longer for the Real Madrid world, but I think, and the same for Ancelotti, right? It's kind of widely known that he's going to leave now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was surprised that he got it wrong so so wrong tactically. I th also think he took Modric and Cruz off at the same time, right? Or sh yeah. within short gap of each other. Yeah. That felt like kind of either throwing the towel in or just... Well, I, is... How did it come across? Because if I like, oh shit, why are you, so, why are you doing that? The first time was obviously took him off and was it Asensio that came on for him? I can't mm -hmm. remember now. Yeah, but yeah, and then he um, bought off... Uh, who was it? He bought off someone for Rudiger at the point. And okay. I thought, okay, so he might be going with a back three and condensing that midfield. But actually what turned around was he maintained a kind of three or four at the back, which was the fascinating bit because he kind of pushed Camavinga, if you remember, mm -hmm. in place of Crow. So that very moment. So it was a bit of a strange dynamic, just the way he yeah, kind of yeah. approached it. And I, I thought... Yeah, I, yeah. He took so he took Modric off for Rudiger, brought off Kroos and bought on Asensio, and then four minutes later took off Camavinga and brought on Chuameni. Like it felt a little bit. Yeah. And then Danny Ceballos one minute later, Vasquez at the same time. Like it felt a little bit that like quite scattergun, isn't it? It was, and I think by that point I was already three nil by that point, and then yeah. it would have been four nil by the time that Vasquez comes on because that was it, game set and done basically. But. Yeah, it just didn't feel like Ancelotti knew what to do in those very moments. And it, mm -hmm. that's an interesting point. Tushimeni, I was surprised that he didn't get, like, it wasn't bought into this match because we know about him being the defensive-minded, maybe yeah, the yeah. grappler or the battler in midfield. 
So when you've got someone like Rodri, Rodri who's doing it for Man City, that would have been a clear good battle because I can't yeah, see yeah. Cruz being that type of player. Modric can put his foot in, but he's not that kind of player. He's you not want a, to do that. He's, you don't. Yeah, want he's him not to do a Kante, it. is he? If you know no, what I mean, he's exactly. not like that breaker you, up. Yeah, you want yeah. him either to create those opportunities in the final third, or you get him in that kind of beyond the defence to help kind of set the play yeah. for the attackers. And that's, I think that was where it potentially went wrong. Maybe he didn't read that and he didn't sort of, maybe set himself upon that. I think, like I alluded to on Monday night show, I think he was just really disappointed that they didn't win the first leg. And I think that really yeah. just, yeah, I think that put them off. But yeah, what was your impressions generally about the atmosphere itself? Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about how, I suppose what our thoughts are going forward now because yeah we'll, we'll um, try and escape the english media and saying that it's definitely man city but no, exactly. um, definitely all i would say is those that were around us weren't taking into lightly let's yeah. put it that way so there yeah, is yeah. some sense i don't think it'll be man city, city fans i don't think no. it'll be genuine city fans who are taking no. it lightly because they, they know city far too well to know that this yes, is a done deal exactly. you know what i mean so i think like typical yeah. city and all that i think they know that they're in for a game but i think yeah. Yeah, just genuinely surprised by how easy Real Madrid made it look um, or how easy Real Madrid made it. Um, and I think the kind of the end of an era there for that Real Madrid mm. team um, and the passing of the baton to the new best football team in the world um, yeah. because it's hard to argue with that point. Also, Kyle Walker, I don't get how he's still so quick at the age of 40. That he did Close some incredible mind. like recovery <laughs> runs, that, especially there was, there was one moment where Vinicius Jr. is doing it on the left-hand side. The linesman should definitely flag, but he's not yeah. with the pace. He's just scrambling yeah. to get in place with it. And Kyle Walker kind of saves his ass basically, because yeah. if that goes into a goal situation, I'm sure VAR has to intervene potentially. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, luckily yeah. Kyle Walker incredible. was incredible with not just his pace, but also his discipline. I think that gets yeah. really lost. He was he wasn't as attacking minded as I expected, but he was very mm -hmm. disciplined in terms yeah, of his yeah. approach and attacks and defensively duties as well. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I was really, really impressed by him. Really impressed by him. Great defender. Great, great defender. But mm -hmm. we're gonna yeah, the final. I think look, obviously Man City are favourites in that form. On the current form, you're looking at it and going, it's gonna be a tough night for Inter and Inter fans yeah. know it's gonna be a tough night. But I do also get the thing of the slight feeling of did they have their perfect performance in the semi-final there is that i i feel like there might be that like you can't replicate that level again no. you can't replicate that level again that is like a zenith performance if you know what i mean and then mm. you have to be like to hit that level again i feel like they're going to be a little bit lower in the final which then gives inter a chance yes. and what, what are your first impressions of the final i think I, I like the fact that it's two different styles of football here. And I think Man City will have yeah. to appreciate that they will get frustrated by this inter side. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a very frustrating is going night. to yeah. basically get the form of Jose Mourinho or whatever it takes mm. just to get that nick of a goal and just defend for their lives. Um, I think if Inter pay, though, Man City too much respect and give them too much of the ball, that's where they could be like exposed and I think that's the, that's the key thing is like we're talking about the age of these players and we're talking about really kind of players that you know it's been kind of tarnished in the English media as like has been you know they used to be playing in Premier League clubs and probably their legs aren't as they used to but I think yeah that's where they could potentially get exploited um but that said, I think, you know, Inter Milan aren't stupid. They're, they're going to play this sensibly. They're going to play it to their strengths as well. And in Lataro and Barella, as we've alluded to, they're the two form players. So yeah. they're, they're going to be the ones that probably Man City will be wary of. They'll be aware of them. And I think that that's going to be interesting battles, if we say it. Because I think mm -hmm. Man City's defence, I think, are very switched on. You you could see, see that against Real. Um, but then again, it's just... <sighs> the midfield battle is going to be the interesting one. And it's a yeah, yeah. question of, does Pep overthink it or does 
Simeone and Zaghi um, overthink it as well. I'm excited to see that Inter Milan midfield against the City midfield. I think mm. Barella, Brozovic, and like Hakan, or like I think that is a, a yeah. very, very good central midfield. <laughs> like, it is. and they're they're more than capable. Like Brozovic, people don't realize, especially people who don't watch say yeah, how much that guy fucking runs. Like he oh, is yeah. gonna run. He will still hit the highest numbers of any player on that pitch, and, and he, he will won't be lose the ball everywhere. He won't Sorry? lose the ball. He won't yeah, lose he the ball. Yeah, he won't lose the ball. He doesn't lose that's, the ball. That's the thing. Yeah. So I think like a player like that is really going to shine in this final. And I think that you're right. That, mid- that midfield battle is going to be fascinating. Lukaku with a point to prove is always a dangerous mm. Lukaku. Yeah. Jekyll up against his old team. I think there's a lot of narrative there. There's a mm. lot of potential. June the 10th, we've already got our place booked in a bar in Milan. We're ready. The two mates we're going, we went with, um, they're now looking on how to get to Istanbul, but I can't afford mm. to take the week off work, I'll be no. honest. Um, but we're going to leave the Champions League there for now. Um, oh, what a final it's going to be. I'm excited. And we're going to yeah. go to the we're going to go to the cool kids club final as Roma, that Roma take on. Sevilla in the final. We have mm. Sevilla, the masters of the Europa League, coming up against the sheer aura of <laughs> Mourinho and his record in European finals. This is going to be this is going to be a fascinating final. But first, we need to talk about the semi-finals and how the teams got there. We're going to start with Roma, who successfully made it there in yep. the most Mourinho performance over 180 minutes. <laughs> um, one nil, of course. I think they had 30. 30% possession last night and they had one shot, I want to say, maybe not even <laughs> yes. one. I'm just getting this stat in front of me. So Roma had an XG of 0.04 0. compared to oh, 0. 0. Art Bayer's 1.14 and the German side had 72% possession, 23 shots on goal while Roma had one and the ball was in play for only 54 minutes. Yeah, and it says at the end of it doesn't get more Mourinho than this. Yeah, no, it's just <laughs> absolute classic Mourinho. And I think obviously we've talked about it before. Something needs to be done about time wasting in football because it is getting ridiculous. But um, you have to play the style of football that comes up against you, and you have to do the best to try and win it. And I think Leverkusen they were much better in this leg than they were in the first leg. I think they were much more of a yes. threat. I think obviously mm-hmm. being at home helped. The atmosphere was very good. Players like Frimpong, like I thought was really impressed by him. Diaby yeah. has been fantastic yes. this season as well. Yeah, yeah. A lot of players there that stood out. Again, some beautiful football, lots of little like like you'd ex- even though Xabi yeah. Alonso is a very new manager, I kind of I expect his teams to play this kind of football, right? It's very yeah, like yeah, on definitely. brand. Um, so it's really nice to watch, even if the game was terrible. And <laughs> Mourinho, you just have to say the spirit that he has instilled in that team like when Mm -hmm. he gets players to buy in right when he gets players to like buy into what he wants to do so it didn't happen at real it didn't happen at united and it didn't happen at the spurs but when it does happen his teams are absolutely formidable because they will run through hellfire for it yeah and this is what we saw with the Roma performance last night. They, those players, I'm sure, want to play nice attacking football. They want to mm. like show off and flare. But they know, if you want to win, this is how we've got to do it. So yeah. do it. And players like Tammy Abraham suddenly becoming a master of the dark arts, I absolutely love. <laughs> um, Bove being moulded as this young player into this perfect yeah. Mourinho shithouse midfielder I'm really enjoying. Um, Pellegrini just sums up that Roma team. I think like there was mm. this performance was all about spirit and belief yeah. and hard work and I think these are things that even if the football is not attractive these those are good things to see in football so I was really mm-hmm. happy for Roma to do it I was happy for Mourinho to do it he's he's going to go back to back Conference League Europa League I think yeah. um, what do you think about Roma their performances Mourinho it was a typical me, right? it was a typical Mourinho performance, wasn't it? As yeah. you've alluded to, you've kind of summed it up already, but um, there's nothing more I can really say apart from I think he definitely had an eye on that defence and mm-hmm. bringing in Cristante to be kind of that guard as well yeah, in yeah. that kind of and playing kind of play as well. And I think, interestingly, obviously, Spinozola goes off in the first half yeah. as well. So Zalewski has to come in and do his duties. But again, didn't really get too troubled. I appreciate no, there was no. a lot of attacks from Bayer Leverkusen, but again, it was. And I, I would reflect on those chances not being that 
kind of clear cut. It was like shots from mm -hmm. distance. There was a few shots that Patricio saves well, I would say. He did make um, some good saves. Yeah. He did make some good saves. And yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say it was that straightforward. But again, I like unlike, say, the Man City and Real Madrid match where you kind of sense that there was going to be a, an opportunity, for example, didn't necessarily see that happening for Leverkusen. It has to be said. I was I was saying to you pre-record why I yeah. chose to put this game on. I, I don't know. know. I, really don't. I will never know. I just I looked at the names of the teams and just went, oh, that's quite a cool game. Yeah, and then turned it on. I was game. like, <laughs> no, this isn't yeah, exactly. this isn't Michael Ballack and Francesco Totti anymore. If you know what I mean? Definitely it's not. not. Like, Definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. No, but. Oh, Gordy Roma, you're in the final. Uh, back to yeah. they hadn't been to a European final for 40, no, wait, for 32 years, I think it was. They hadn't, they hadn't um, been to a final. They've now done yeah. two in a row back to back. Incredible what Mourinho is getting done there with very little spending. Yes. Even not even by Mourinho standards, just very yes. little spending. Exactly. They are he's getting them all sorts of places. So I'm really, really happy for them. On the other side of the draw, now we said it on Monday, I think, that yeah. I really wanted a Roma Juve final because I wanted did, the Mourinho. Yes. I really, really yeah. wanted it. So I found myself really dirty last night hoping that Juve <laughs> would win. It didn't feel great, I'll be honest. I've now showered three times. It's fine. It's it's, it's off me. But Jesus Christ, Juve managed to fuck it up with the most. Ale we're we're going to talk the most Mourinho tactics now. Are you ready for the most Allegri tactics? <laughs> because yes. I think Juve actually had the better of the game. I think they I were the better so, yeah. team. They were creating yeah. the better chances. Uh, Bono had to make a load of decent saves. Mm. Um, of course, Vlaovic eventually gets the goal, and you think, okay, right, you've been attacking yeah. all game. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing that. Mm. Sevilla aren't getting a sniff. Just keep going. No. <laughs> Allegri <laughs> decides 1-0. Let's like, shut up sharp and just see this one out. Yeah. Shock. So then, Sevilla being Sevilla, of course, get back into the game. Now, the first goal is an absolute banger of a goal. Like, he yes. just do so. Like, pings it into the net. Mm. Like, beautiful, beautiful goal. And then the second goal, again, it just feels like Juve has sat far too deep. They're inviting pressure. Yeah, and then Tottenham fans will be fuming. A <laughs> a Lamela goal set up by Brian Hill in a European yeah. semi final to that get sounds, you to yeah. a final. Um, but the, the the one thing that stuck out to me here was they allowed Eric Lamela to have a header. Mm. That screams to me the centre backs not doing their job. Definitely not. Definitely like, not. I don't know how many headers Lamella has scored in his career, but you can probably count them on one hand, I would imagine. No, yeah. We'll just... um, so I think a another day where Juve fans are getting pissed off with Allegri. Um, are you surprised they didn't they didn't get through this? I kind of did expect I'm... them to get through. Before the match, and I mean I said it on Monday, I, I fancied Sevilla just purely mm. because Sevilla at home is a different like entity to saying yeah. severe away from home if that was severe away from home then you might expect the juventus at least mm. with the home crowd element to get behind the team and maybe there would have been a few more fans for this game as well especially but um yeah i, I kind of when you, when the game went on you kind of felt like oh actually juventus they've been very good they've been you know slowly but surely trying to drag it and even once it was one all there were still some opportunities. I think, to your point though, Cadrado was very lucky to be on the pitch. I think it was <laughs> yes, that true. that incident in particular where it's kind of on the line of being a penalty slash, you mm -hmm. know, something else. Yeah. Um, that was very, very dodgy. I felt like if someone no, was, intervenes there, was. that is mm -hmm. definitely a red card potentially there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But other than that, yeah, I mean... <sighs> I mean, there's a few poor performances in there as well because, like, the midfield kind of didn't really do much. Mm -hmm. They absorbed it and they just let... Sometimes passive, I think, is the right word. They just yeah, let yeah. the severe team go through them at times. So I think from that point of view, yeah, they got their just desserts and yeah. maybe, to an extent, maybe that kind of indicates the end of this team as well because there's certain individuals in that squad that were just waiting for this end yeah, of season yeah. now. It felt like they weren't necessarily kind of doing much and i know chiesa came on probably in better positions to like do a lot more mm -hmm. but vlaovic seems like he's got something about him now he seems like he's just tweaked something in his kind of game mm -hmm. he's a lot more confident now going forward 
Um, but yeah, I think you were generally going to see a lot of these players gone, gone in the summer. Yeah, Pared- yeah, yeah. Paredes, Di Maria, I think is gone. I'm pretty um, sure Paredes was smiling at the end of the game. <laughs> it wouldn't, it wouldn't was, surprise me. I was watching it on YouTube and he was just stood there with a smile on his face. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, mate. <laughs> like, you Don't know, make it too like obvious. 500 cameras in this bloody stadium, right? Maybe just like cover your mouth or something, you idiot. But I did also want to just say Chesney. Had an incredible game. He made some unbelievable saves. Like when Sevilla were really putting the pressure on, I was like, he kept Juve in that to, to for it yeah. to be a 95th minute winner or whatever it was. Yeah. That was down to Chesney because he was pulling off some unbelievable and screaming at his defense, like, for fuck's yeah. sake, guys, <laughs> someone do something. Like it was a bit ridiculous. So I think, yeah. Juve, as you said, they probably got what they deserved. Sevilla in another Europa League final, despite <laughs> battling relegation in La Liga. I know. They're still, right. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible. They are still able to make their way to a final. And if they beat Roma, I don't think anybody, anybody would be surprised because it's Sevilla. That's what they do. But another, yeah. I think, very interesting final. I think it will be really yes. interesting to watch. Um, and I think... Two very contrasting styles, maybe, again. Um, I would could take be... it with a pinch of salt, though. I suspect it's going to be one of those that could be a proper shit house final as well. Yeah. It's one or the other. It's not going to be... I think like a... there is, there is going to be a lot of people just rolling around on the floor in this game for a very <laughs> yes, <long time>. yes. <laughs> It's like Porto versus Porto B-side, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you like, if you if you hate, you know, the dark arts and shit housing, this isn't the final for you because I <laughs> yeah. think Mourinho is already coming up with new levels of it, I imagine. But we do need to move on from the Cool Kids Club and very quickly go to the even cooler Kids Club mm. final. As it, we got the final we wanted, Adam, we got we the did. final we wanted. This it looked we like for a while we weren't going to get it. it. Fiorentina tried really hard yeah. to not give it <laughs> they, us. They tried their best, but. but yeah. We did get it as West Ham will face Fiorentina in Prague. Mm-hmm. Um, Fiorentina were fantastic in this game. They were absolutely yeah. fantastic. I feel like ba- Basel are a really weird team because what they've done consistently through this tournament is cling on. They've yes. just clinged on and managed to get that goal and just get that last-minute equaliser. They've got through on penalties a few times, but they've showed that belief, that spirit, that discipline, that they don't let the game get away from them. They Mm. don't get carried away and just stop bombing balls forward, whatever. They stick, they've got their game plan, they stick to what they do, and they know that it will work, right? Mm. And it has got them this far. So I think I was really impressed by their discipline, and the guy who scored the goal for them, whose name now escapes me. Barak. Barak. um, Sorry? Oh, you mean Amandini? No, for Basel. Amandini. um, Amandini. It was a beautiful, beautiful finish. Mm. It was an incredible finish. The touch to get round the defender and then put it into the far corner was a really, really Mm. beautiful finish. Um, So I think they showed their moments of quality. um, But throughout this game... um, Oh, Amdouni. Sorry, was it Amdouni? Amdouni, yeah. Amdouni, yeah, yeah. Amdouni. Um, They did show their quality, but throughout this match, Fiorentina, it was just an absolute onslaught. And I was really impressed by the just attacking verve they went with. Because I think... If we look at Roma Sevilla, or if we look at Roma, that was a team who probably needed to win, right? Or could have done with a win, but they went with the defensive mindset and didn't shift from it. Fiorentina, once they got that goal that they needed, they didn't shut up shop. They Mm. didn't, they just went, no, this is working. Just keep going. And they were just doing everything, throwing it at them. Gonzalez was unbelievable for for Fiorentina. He's had a very good season in general for Fiorentina. Mm -hmm. I think he has been one of their better players. So to see him doing so well in the semi-final was fantastic. And then, of course, our boy, Antonin Barak, we've been repping him since his Hellas Verona days, comes off the bench with a beautiful finish to Mm -hmm. secure the win. And I think um, a really, really just impressive performance from Fiorentina. And as I was watching it, I was thinking them and West Ham are actually pretty well suited, pretty well yeah. matched. I think yeah. in terms of quality, I think it's going to be an interesting one, but what did you think of Fiorentina, the goals, Basel? Yeah, they kind of dragged out the match definitely by making it a bit more squeaky bum time by the fact mm-hmm. of uh, letting Basel back into this match. But I think for value, they definitely, were up for the game. They seemed like yeah. they were definitely, they had a mission. They knew what they had to do. Nico Gonzalez, we know what a player he can be. This is the interesting thing. Oh, it would be fascinating to see if he still is there by the end of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Barak as well. He had so many like clear cut 
chances in the ends. Like there was some yeah, yeah. opportunities where it just wasn't going in, and then that last moment shoots, and that's it, game over basically. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, just especially 120th minute, it is basically on dead on time yeah. for we're going into penalties. If that game doesn't done. go, yeah. that's penalties basically. So. Fascinating, brilliant result for Fiorentina. They reversed what they did in the first leg by actually winning it. And yeah, I mean, I'm so looking forward to this final because also we're talking about West Ham here. And yeah, I was I do. This game as well. And I have to say, it didn't look like it was going to happen. Like that, I didn't feel like they were going to get another goal. But boy, for now, for that run, that nutmeg, incredible, incredible. Like, a really beautiful run. And I think Declan Rice said it in the post-match interview, because now, obviously, I, uh, being an Arsenal fan, I'm a little bit obsessed with Declan Rice, and my heart will be broken if this move doesn't go through. But I was watching his post-match interview, and he was saying, like, Four Niles is a player who hasn't really played as much this year as he's, as he'd expected. Mm -hmm. He's kind of been in and out of the team. But the best thing about this squad is that when people come in, they're doing their job, and they're doing what's needed. And Four Niles is just... He's a player that, from when he was at Villarreal, I've always liked him as a player, I think. I think he's very like he's a bit hot and cold right he's not yeah. consistent he's not as consistent as he could be but i think he shows moments of real quality some of the goals he scores are outstanding i know west ham fans really like him and i think that goal just shows a really cool head yeah. at quite a hot-headed time if you know what i mean within mm. that game it's like right at the end it's kind of pushing and yeah to just secure that win for the team was huge and the the celebration and the scenes for the west ham players and fans yeah now we'll talk about the fans in a minute i suppose but yeah. the scenes for the players and seeing mark noble is just i love that he's just never left he's just never left he's just <laughs> there in the change room getting the beers in for the lads and everyone's yeah, like exactly. going a bit mad and singing about jared bowen shagging danny dyer's daughter and it's all <laughs> like proper west ham in it it's all proper west ham um I absolutely love it. And you can see how much it means just to everybody at that club. Like they yeah. know that to win anything there would be absolutely gigantic. Yeah, and they've massive. got a huge, huge chance here. Um, but yeah, were there any players in this game where you were like, I think Pakatai again was fantastic, but were there yeah. any players where you thought they really stood out? Uh, yeah, I think Paqueta, I think he's really proved his worth now. I, I, like we said, we didn't really see the best out of him at Milan. We knew there was something inconsistent at Lyon, but yeah, yeah, boy, did he take it on. I think also they were marshaled really well at the back. They were really sh quite strong. And yeah, uh, Arelo Alfonso, I think it is, is the yeah, goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. he was solid, solid. You wouldn't yeah, have yeah. known that Fabianski wasn't there. Like he was no, exactly. so incredible yeah, yeah. in terms of that goalkeeping, marshalling. And I think there's a few times where if he doesn't come out, then that opens up that opportunity for mm -hmm. the AZ attackers anyway. Um, but yeah, I did, again, I didn't necessarily feel a bit like the Basel game that they had enough to really kind of test West Ham. It didn't feel like West Ham were really that pushed. I think if anything, West Ham kind of pushed the narrative. They tried to open up the kind of defence but they were just blocked out by the AZ Alkmaar defence, really, and they were kind of heroic, I suppose. Uh, but it was literally after that go goal goes in, you kind of sense that if there was about 10 minutes to go, West Ham gets a second, get and that's game one. over. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that would have been it. So really well drilled, and I think that's credit to David Moyes as well, because I think mm -hmm. the way he set it up was definitely, it was all about absorbing that pressure. He knew yeah, it was yeah. going to be a case of, this is going to be a hard slog, but he made it really count. So Fair play to West Ham, and they're in a final. Um, they are in. I can't believe we're saying that. West a Ham in European final. final. Incredible, incredible. Um, before we go for a break, before we do the preview, mm. just very quickly, what do you expect from this final? I think there's going to be it's going to be a decent footballing final. I think it's going to be two teams that go for it. I can't see this being a cagey affair. No, I can't see it. And I think the interesting thing is. They've got some classy players on both sides, right? Yeah. So some yeah, really yeah. good players that can pull it on and really show it its worth. I think it's going to be a question of who's going to win the moments because I think both have their kind of game winners, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it'll be very interesting who kind of wins those battles. Um, as we traditionally say, it's whoever's best to the second ball, who yeah. can pick it up. And I, I think with these two sides... It could be quite end to end. I, I, I don't know about you. I feel like I it mean, could be one of both those teams, like, really open games. 
both teams have really got nothing to lose, really. I don't think there's a heavy favourite in this game. There's no. no one who's coming in and going, right, the pressure is on us to win. It's like, okay, we can just go for this and try and win it. Let's try and win it. Yeah. Like, So I think going in with that lack of caginess and that lack of like the pressure, I think will really help both teams be able to go in mm. properly and attack it. Um, for Fiorentina, they've just got to hope that the chance doesn't fall to Luka Jovic because he yeah. is, when the chance comes, just make sure Jovic isn't on the end of yeah. it because he still managed to miss two or three chances at the end <laughs> and he only came on for a bit. So I think, yeah, as long as it doesn't fall to him, Fiorentina might have a chance. But a really exciting final there and we will be covering all of them, of course, and watching bloody all of them. I'm excited. Yeah. Yes. Every single one, even Roma Sevilla. Right. So I think that is <laughs> the European review done, really. Um, yeah. We did want to talk about um, the AZ Altmar fans very quickly. Um, yeah. I've put it on the Twitter as well. I just, I'm going to call it out every time I see it. If this was English fans doing this in an English ground or a, gr or a ground abroad, trying yeah. to attack people or the player's family or whoever it is. This there would be absolute uproar. There would yep, be definitely. talk of bans from UEFA. There would be mm. an actual reaction. And now I, I don't know if there's been a reaction in the Dutch press. I don't know. So I don't want to make any um, assertions. But in the UK, the newspapers would be saying how disgusting it is and how this needs to be rid in the game. I think for a while, the problem with crowd violence, etc., has been worse in Europe, in mainland Europe, than it has been in England for a while. And I just think it needs to be mm. called out that these fucking scumbags should be banned yeah. from the ground and something needs to be done about the because you see it with frankfurt fans you see it with fans yeah. from eastern europe you see it all across europe really fans in italy like and something needs to be done about it because yeah. yeah the english have a reputation but i think it's not the 90s anymore like i don't know mm. how deserved some of it is um so yeah i don't know anything to say about that yeah, it's just disgusting to see kind of that reaction, if that makes sense. I think, mm -hmm. like, I never really associated AZ Alkmaar as being that kind of I knew nothing element, about them, but <laughs> I mean, to see that was a bit disappointing. And But then mm -hmm. I do know of that hooligan rivalry between, the, like, the Rotterdam clubs, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. You've obviously got PSV, you've got Ajax, of the tradition of it. And it seems quite kind of a more European thing at the moment, mm -hmm. where they've kind of inspired by those kind of late... 80s english yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. hooliganism and they brought it into europe thinking that's a big thing for them to kind of strive towards and yeah yeah, yeah it's disappointing to see but also we did speak offline how funny it was someone from that generation protecting the west ham <laughs> families plays families and still that's taking on this mob of like well i won't go into words that you called it but yeah People dressed in black, taking yeah. on this one 50 <laughs> yeah. year old, and he's for his efforts, he's just got a ripped off Ben Sherman shirt at the end. Yeah. So, uh, he yeah. blew the dust off the knuckle dusters and just started <laughs> yeah. fucking throwing, throwing haymakers <laughs> at these kids. Um, yeah, it was great to see. <laughs> Um, getting taught a few lessons so you know that's quite nice um but we're going to leave it there for now guys we're going to take a very quick break and we are going to talk premier league Serie A and a bit of ivan tony hi my name is Dimi constantopoulos and you're listening to the anglo-italian podcast and here we are the final part of the show guys and it's time to preview the premier mm. league now there are only a few important not important, big games this yeah. weekend, let's say. Um, so today, as you guys are listening, the one of the three o'clock kickoffs, which I think is particularly interesting, is Liverpool taking on Aston Villa. Now, Villa on 57 points, Liverpool on 65. So a bit of a gap, but mm -hmm. this is a huge game in terms of the top four race as United, Liverpool, um, as United and Liverpool are only separated by one point now. I think this is a chance... Um, for Villa to continue their very good form um, after a fantastic mm -hmm. win last weekend against Tottenham as well. Liverpool also in very good form. I feel like Villa have the potential to stop Liverpool here. How do you feel this, this game might go? It could be a very interesting game. And just having a look at the stats, and there's an interesting one that says Liverpool in the last five occasions have beaten Villa on each oh, of them okay. so far so this is maybe where it goes a bit pear-shaped for Villa but mm -hmm. I think if you base it on form alone then I would say definitely Uno Emery's kind of style of football will be there to frustrate Klopp's style of football even though we've been talking up how well Liverpool have been and obviously they got a fantastic result on Monday night against Leicester City um, I think you know this could be an interesting matchup and it's just a question of 
Unai Emery maybe exploiting what he sees as maybe the weaknesses for Liverpool. So mm -hmm. obviously Alexander Arnold's in good form, but does he exploit that side knowing that he's not as strong on his defensive duties? Mm -hmm. Again, I think if you play through the middle, then potentially there's an opportunity there as well because we know traditionally that midfield isn't as strong as say if you're talking about the wings, for example. So I, I think this is an interesting matchup based on the form of both sides. And yeah, if either side has that ambition, really they have to win this game. That mm -hmm. That is it. A point of peace is probably not enough for both to really do yeah, much. Then I think it, it goes down then to their fiction list, right? So I think Liverpool, if I remember rightly, have a more favourable run. Yeah, they've got Southampton away and Southampton are obviously relegated already. Uh, whereas Aston Villa, if I'm not mistaken, are away to Man United, are they? Yes. Um, so just having a look, actually, they're at home to Brighton. So oh, that okay. is wow. quite right. a big That's game a big in itself, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting matchup. But, yeah, I could see Liverpool winning this. I think it's going to be 2-0. What about you? I like that. Yeah. No, I think I, I think it's going to be a draw. I think it's going to be no good for anybody. Okay. I think Villa are going to get something and Liverpool will be disappointed. Um, but, yeah, that's the first of the three o'clock kickoffs. Elsewhere, we have Wolves versus Everton in a kind of basement battle. Everton fans are going to get to you this weekend because it's coming up. Um, yeah. Bournemouth taking on Manchester United. Fulham taking on Palace. And the late kickoff on Saturday is Nottingham Forest hosting Arsenal. It doesn't matter anymore. Can we just win, please? <laughs> um, then on Sunday, now this is the interesting one, Everton fans, where this is where you come in. We mm. now have West Ham taking on Leeds United. So Leeds United go to what I suspect is going to be a very hungover West Ham United, who yeah. only have one win in their last five in the Premier League as well. They're not in good form in the Premier League. Leeds, this is your chance Big Sam going back to the London Stadium. This is your chance to get a win where Everton, as I said, have a very tricky tie away to Wolves. I think this could be a real turning point or a big moment in the relegation battle because both the teams are, are separated by one point. So if Everton lose and Leeds win, suddenly Everton are two points adrift at the bottom of the table. So this could be a huge, huge weekend. And as we've said, we have seen an improvement in Leeds under Sam Allardyce, a bit more solid, um, scored a few goals too, mm. but they're, no, wait, three, but they're starting yeah. to um, start to show a bit of improvement. So I think this game could be one where maybe, maybe Leeds get a result, depending how many beers Declan Rice had last night. Because we know <laughs> he, he, he never really drank before, but we saw him with a Heineken last night. So he might get bad hangovers. You never know. Maybe, but I, I sense he's that type of player that can probably take it away and still come the next day and still be the best player on the yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's still the kind of person he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, he's yeah that typical yeah, Sunday yeah, league that's player that that's really fair. pisses you off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting, though. Dave Moyes technically has a better record over Sam Allardyce. So this is where it could be down to. It could be down to that. Um, I know for West Ham, though, they're a bit more favourable in terms of their league position, right? So mm. do they kind of see this as an opportunity to rest their players ahead of that Europa Conference final? I don't know. Um, they might rotate it, though, Rory. They might yeah. rotate it. I think it, we, might so. see, we might see a, a heavily rotated team uh, because... Mm. I think they flew back last night, so it's going to be a bit of a quick yeah. turnaround. Um, but elsewhere in the Premier League, the final matches we have on Sunday again, we have Brighton taking on already relegated Southampton. Brighton, fuck you, Brighton. Losing 5-1, <laughs> I just have to say this very quickly, losing 5-1, beating yeah. us 3-0 and then losing 4-1 is fucking infuriating. <laughs> I hope you're happy. Enjoy your pathetic little <laughs> win because you've ruined a lot. You're um, that guy from Come Dine with exactly, me, Exactly. To, yeah. <laughs> to quote a meme legend, enjoy your pathetic little win because it's embarrassing. Anyway, fuck's sake. Then on Sunday, we do have, talking of which, the chance for Man City to be crowned champions as they take mm -hmm. on Chelsea. Is this going to go any other way than Man City being crowned? Do I have any reason for hope, Adam? No. No, I it's think it's going to happen. Isn't it? it's it's not not, close. They could rotate the whole eleven and still somehow win because it's Lampard's Same. Chelsea, isn't it? That's the problem. Yes. <laughs> they, but do you never know? I, I'm actually going to put it out there. I think Chelsea might even shock us and score a goal in this match. There you Oof. go. I think we'll, we'll give them give them a chance. Maybe Mudrick in like the 89th minute or something stupid like that. But yeah, by that point, it might be like five-one. Who knows? 
I um, saw a fantastic tweet today from a Chelsea account. Oh my god, it's incredible! It's like Todd Bowley's wish list, right? You know, like on a wish list, you yeah, expect like four or five players. It was like he wants Anana, Mainyan. He wants like <laughs> there was like three keepers, and it was like midfielders. It was like Barella. He wants Brozovic. He wants uh, Milinkovic Savic, and then strikers was like Osimhen, Vlavic. I was like, fucking hell, how much is he going to chuck about again? Really? Is he after really? it again? It yeah. did make me laugh. I was like, it's not a wish list. That's like a database on football manager of just the best players in the world. Oh, God, what a club. Anyway, <laughs> I do think Man City are going to get the win there. They will be crown champions, I imagine. Yeah. Um, and then the weekend finishes with Newcastle taking on Leicester City. Newcastle, mm. massive win against Brighton. That basically guarantees them European football, just not necessarily Champions League football. But coming up against a Leicester who look like they are pretty much relegated... Um, could be the win that I think would secure them Champions League um, qualification or would get them very close, depending on other results. Mm. But that's everything in the Premier League, apart from the fact that the early kickoff, I can hear you screaming, yes, the early kickoff on the Saturday is Tottenham versus Brentford. Now, we need to talk about Ivan Tony very quickly. Yes. A lot of things confuse me about this. Firstly, <laughs> firstly, I am very happy that this Man City Brentford game now means fuck all. Because if yeah. Arsenal had to were fighting for the title and then Brentford's best player gets He's suspended banned. in time for them to play Man City, I don't think that's a particularly good look for the Premier League. Um no. now there's a lot that's quite crooked about this, I think, but that it starts with that. I think yeah. this ban could have waited two matches. Yeah, it could it have could, waited. Could have. It could have waited until the end of the season. Give everyone a fair crack of the whip, right? Everyone yeah. else has played against Tony. It's not something that we'll get into whether we agree or disagree with the ban itself anyway. Yeah, yeah, fine. But I think doing it two games before the season ends is so pointless. Maybe there's a thing of like, okay, some of his ban will be used up by the summer and that's why they've done it. I'm not it sure. Like yeah. But you could still do it at half past five yeah. on the last Sunday, the yeah. ban starts, right? Like the second that game's finished, the band starts. It just feels like very suspicious. And if the game did matter between Brentford and Man City for the title race, I would be fucking fuming because yeah, it would make exactly. a huge, huge difference to how effective Brighton can, uh, Brentford can be. But Adam, what are your opinions on the ban itself? We've talked about gambling in football and the mm -hmm. very close relationship that they have. Yeah, Has he been harshly treated? I think he's been quite harshly treated. There is two thoughts that I have. So I think, yes, they needed to make a firm but decisive ban, whatever they were going to do. So they had to make it like you've done this multiple times. We're not talking yeah. just one occasion. This is that's the other. Yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. This is not like, oh, yeah, he's just done it one weekend by accident. He's done this multiple times in his career. Um, but so there's that element do i believe in proportion to other bits that the fa have dished out for example against racism like the, when we saw suarez and evra for example in that suspension versus this it's disproportionate definitely um and then uh, there's also that human aspect of do we feel if if and this is the thing that probably isn't really known and it probably would never get known but does Tony actually have a gambling addiction, for example? Mm -hmm. So is this the right kind of thing to do, giving him time off to do whatever he wants, potentially? Like, how does that kind of work out mentally for him? Because, I mean, we I know we talked on our WhatsApp group about whatever happens, he'll be an incredible buy. Um, but what do Brentford do? What What's their scenario? What, what, what must be going through their heads? Because they're like... Do we kind of like just get a striker for a season, like just to mm -hmm. fill that gap in and then hope that when Tony comes in, it might take him a month to get back to his sharpness, yeah, but yeah, then yeah. he will be there? Or do they kind of sell him this summer? And and then when you think about it, how does that ban work in Europe? Does it actually only affect him in the UK? So therefore, mm -hmm. he'd be a great signing for the likes of Bayern Munich, for example, or yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, somewhere yeah. else. So. I mean, that, that's the interesting thing. Could they even loan him out to abroad? Yeah, Could they loan yeah, him out yeah. for like half a season just to ensure that his fitness is there? I don't know what the rules are there. But yeah, I think there's there's so many kind of little aspects to consider with him. Um, I think the FA have got to now, when they do any further bans that are more of a serious nature, they've got to follow through with something similar. 
The next this player that gets caught up in a racism row, that is going to have to be a be bloody big ban because otherwise you are showing where your priorities are. And I yeah. think my, my main thing, and it's a point that's been made by lots and lots of people, but this is a player who developed his career playing in the Sky Bet Championship, Sky Bet League One, Sky Bet League Two. He wore gambling sponsors on his shirt. Every award he won for player of the match, player of the month, had a betting had a betting yeah. company on it. The whole thing, every advertising hoarding around him has got a betting company on it. Yeah. If you are if you have young people in your industry and you are glamorizing betting, that's what you're doing. You're showing like, yeah. look, this game lives off this. This is what is the game. Like, mm. it's a huge part of the game. You can't then punish them so heavily for betting. Now, I understand yeah. there's things with match fixing and stuff like that, but it, it doesn't feel like he was betting on Brentford games. I mean, that, that hasn't really been brought into it. That it was betting on, you know, a, a throw in in the 33rd minute against United. It was just generally betting on football. I think it's incredibly harsh, honestly, and I think that football needs to re reassess its its relationship with gambling because they yeah, are they are putting it in the mind of young men or young women, young players, whatever it is. They're putting it in their mind, and then they're going to punish them the second they do it. It just seems mm -hmm. really, really um, counterintuitive. And as you said, it's a bigger ban than has been handed out for Luis Suarez when he got done being racist to Evra. Like yeah. he only got a couple of weeks, I think. Um, it wasn't yeah. a long ban, so they have shown their priorities. If we ever thought their priorities were anywhere else, we now know that they're definitely, definitely not. Um, <laughs> so I feel, I feel quite bad for Ivan Tony, really. And yeah, if he's got a gambling addiction, then that's a problem that needs to be dealt with, and the club should be dealing with it. The Premier League should be dealing with it. They should be offering more support for these things, mm -hmm. um, not punishing them. And if it is just maybe it's just him fancying a bet, and it's not, it doesn't, not everything has to be an addiction, and it's just a bit no, stupid. Yeah. I just feel like it's it's been incredibly harshly treated. So yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but. This could put a big dent in what was becoming a very, very, very successful and exciting career. Like, it takes a long mm. time for players to recover from breaks like this. So we'll see. But yeah, mm, a bit depressing. Um, we're yeah. going to move on from the Premier League there, and we're going to do Serie A preview. Adam, yes, and the Amos. Let's talk about it. So as we currently record right now, so for you potentially listeners and viewers, you might be seeing this result already, but Sassuolo are currently beating Monza 1-0 through courtesy of a Berardi penalty. Classic. So typical. <laughs> Even uh, more classic happens. Berardi penalty. Nice. Yeah, exactly. On the 45th minute as we speak, so it's going into the second half. Um, but as we talk about it from a Saturday perspective, we'll start off with the early kickoff in Serie A, and that is Cremonese taking on Bologna. Cremonese pretty much down, unfortunately. But yeah, let's see what happens in this match. But the big matches actually happen later on. So we've got at 5 p.m. GMT plus one. We've got Atalanta taking on Hellas Verona. <sighs> big game for Hellas. We talked about how they're kind of were in a good position, Rory, um, but they take on the Atalanta side that are very indifferent in terms of their form. Obviously, still in that mix. I mean, do you give Hellas a chance, especially away to Atalanta, who are not great at home themselves, are they? Their home form is terrible, so I'm always going to give Hellas Verona a chance. Yeah. And I feel like um, they have shown signs of improvement and Atalanta did have that awful loss to Salernitana last weekend. So mm. I feel like there's definitely a chance of Verona just turning up and getting something here. Definitely, definitely. Good stuff. And then in the later kickoff, 7.45, we've got Milan taking on Sampdoria. Sampdoria already down. Uh, lucky to even get any points at this stage of yeah. the season. More probably consolidating their transfer and wage bills at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but they're taking on Milan. Um, obviously, Milan need a big win, potentially, just to, if anything, just get a goal difference. Just yeah. increase that goal difference. That might be where it goes into the last game of the season. So, yeah, good opportunity there. Um, let's see what Milan do. And for Pioli's sake, maybe save his career. from They the have to win this game. Yes. Like they have to. They've already they lost to Spezia in between the two European ties, remember? Like this mm. a, a lot of Sampdoria, I'm sorry, but like this is a this is a free hit yeah. for Sampdoria and so much pressure on Milan to get the win here. Exactly. Because otherwise it really starts looking like a 
basket fire of, a, of, of an end of the season here. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. The good thing is that Milan are at home, right? So they should really be. They should. Um, they should. They should get this one done. They, they have should. to. Anyway, we're moving to Sunday. Sunday is the big game, Rory. So we have got Lecce taking on Spezia at 11.30. Big relegation, six-pointer. It could be a point Massive. of peace. I suspect there could be goals, dare I say. Um, but yeah, which way do you see this going, Rory? This is a game. This is possibly the game I'm looking forward to the most I know. this weekend so in Serie A. Like, Ooh. Which <laughs> might say a little bit me about being a masochist or something because nobody yeah. looks at Lecce and Spezia and is like, oh, here we go. But <laughs> yeah. I think, honestly, because there's so much on the line, as you said, they're separated by what? Uh, two points, um, yes, both two just points. hovering outside the relegation zone. This is massive. Spezia off that huge result against Milan, as we said. Lecce with a massive result against Lazio, even though they didn't get the win, it was a great performance. Mm. They should have won it. So I think it's two teams who are really finding performances when they need to. So I, yeah, I expect a few goals. Lecce don't let many in, in general. No, um, no. But I feel like they, they they do score a few. So I think there could be like a, a three, four goals, four goals in this game, I'm going to mm. say. I'm not going to say where they're going to go, but four goals in four this goals. game. And there's going to be lots of fight, as I said, because it's it's a big one. It's a big one. Mm. It's either that or red cards. Let's see. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'll take some of them as well. I'll take some yeah, of them. Why and not, a, why and not? a Strafetza goal. It's been a while since Strafetz has scored. It'd be nice yeah, to he again. seems like he hasn't been on score sheet for a number of mm -hmm. weeks. Um, we're moving to 2 p.m. So we've got Torino versus Fiorentina. But then another banger, Rory. Napoli at home to Inter at 5 p.m. An now, interesting one. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've seen the news, Rory, but it feels like this could be the end of Spalletti at Napoli. The rumours are coming out that De Laurentiis <laughs> yes. has had a falling out yes. with the guy, so it feels like his days are numbered. The other news that came out from Napoli earlier this week, Zielinski and I think it's Mario Rui are not being offered contracts, so they'll be off potentially. Now, Napoli, in terms of uh, Zielinski, he's tied down for another season, but he's been told by his agent that he can start looking at other clubs. And this is where I put that tweet on Wednesday before yeah. the Man City match going 3-2-1, waiting for Liverpool to be linked. And yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be surprising if that happens. But again... Good player potentially, Rory, for Arsenal if the opportunity does Oof, come across. But Stephen Cole, Stephen Cole just mentioned he's not Brazilian, so therefore you guys yeah. aren't going to sign him. So yeah, he's not eligible, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't know how to samba, so he's not going to be able to go into the change <laughs> room. Um, no, with the um, okay, let's talk about De La Rentes. Yeah. If you ever wonder why why don't Napoli fans really love a guy who saved the club, right? We've talked about the fantastic job he's done at Napoli yeah. and how he's rescued them from Serie D and got them to the Scudetto and done these amazing things. And I was like, this is why he can't not be the main character. He can't. He just can't not be the main character. And I think now that Spalletti is there and he is obviously the idol of the fans and he's delivered this thing that means there will be a statue of him somewhere, whether yeah. official or not, there will be a statue. Yeah. Um, and I think he just can't stand not being the main character. And I think this is just a classic De La Rentis move of, oh, well, you know what? You can go now. You've done your job. I'll get someone yeah, else. Exactly. It's either that or Spalletti has asked to hold on to some of these players and De La Rentis has gone. No, we're not holding on to these players, and there's been an argument. But yeah. I get the feeling that it's De Laurentiis not being particularly happy about not being the main character because he is kind of like that. If you saw his interview post the Scudetto win on CBS, yeah. very, very interesting guy. I loved the interview, thought it was fascinating. Yeah. Instantly just moaning about the Champions League ref was brilliant um, on a night you've won the league. I really did respect that a lot. But yeah, he seems like a very strange guy. So not massively surprising, but I think Napoli fans mm. will set fire to the stadium if this play is sacked. Well, yeah. He I, is I, I don't know about you, but in. I think he's just going to walk. I think he's yeah, just that yeah, type yeah. of person that on principle, he's going to say, look, I've delivered you what you wanted now. You don't, want, it. You don't yeah. want me to be here to do a project cool let me go somewhere else and it wouldn't surprise me if he just decides to have a few months off just just yeah, literally yeah. doesn't turn up into a, ma a game like he might you know because the interesting dynamic is also one of the napoli directors has moved on to juventus so does he potentially get then talks about that as a replacement for legri i mean that would be fascinating wouldn't it it would that be fascinating would be... 
but yeah. Horrible, uh, because he would do yes. a very good job at yes. Juve. <laughs> he would do a very good job. He'd get job them playing, Juve. that's for yeah. sure. Um, he would definitely get them playing. But Rory, but yeah, just so, mindful of time. Exactly. But, but yes. this game, to actually talk about Napoli Inter, you know, to, like, it doesn't matter, but it does. Like for Inter, this mm. is huge, right? If they they need this for top four, Napoli have just been dog shit since they've won the yeah. league because they've won the league. Mm. But this game is a game they kind of need to win because the fans don't want to go out with, oh, you know, we won the league, but we got battered by Inter. So I think there's actually, it's a really, all of a sudden, Napoli have to get their game faces on again and go, okay, right, big game. So it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that because Inter, they're coming for it. They are coming for it. Mm. Well, let's see. Let's see. We also have on Sunday evening Udinese at home to Lazio at 7:45. Lazio a bit in free for all, um, as we mentioned on Monday night's review. Udinese, a team that was doing so well at the beginning of this half yeah, of the yeah. season, and then they've kind of slummeted a bit of late. Uh, let's see what happens there. And then I'll quickly move on to Monday when we'll do our Monday night review, Rory. So at 5.30 p.m., we've got Roma taking on Salernitana. Not normally would I say... It's not a day off. I know, Why right? But normally, Rory, I would not normally say Salernitana stand a chance, but I actually genuinely feel so, so like, who the knows? form that he's going to do. Yeah. I, I can see a 1-0 win here, potentially, and for straight the hell out of Roma and Mourinho. So let's wait and see. And then we've got Empoli, who don't normally offer much at this end of the season, taking on Juventus. Juventus probably just need the points, especially yeah. Rory. We didn't mention this, but they've got a 15-point deduction, haven't they? That has happened. So they yes. have. Yes, so it's now been back done. to mid-table. So uh <laughs> yes, this is something we'll probably talk in a bit more detail, maybe on Monday night show, right? Um, but yeah. It's like the hokey cokey, in out, in out, you know. <laughs> Shake it all it's about. All, shake it all about. It's <laughs> all over the place. Juve do not know where they're going, but it's good fun to watch. So, yeah, all of a sudden, like he's under massive pressure again. I bet he's just absolutely hating this season. Jesus Christ. He must yeah. be hating it. Well, that is the weekend, guys. Thanks for your patience. Um, we wanted to do this on a Friday to give the European semifinals a proper review and give it a kind of full talk about we feel like the Europa League and Conference League isn't really talked about enough and you know that we've got a lot of time for those competitions so and we, also um, the energy levels the energy levels we were definitely also between the two of us also Struggling. energy levels and because it's <laughs> Friday I've got beer in the house so that definitely helps um but yes thanks for your patience thanks for joining us we hope we we hope you enjoy your footballing weekend now we did get a little bit of a Salernitana mention in but our customary quote of the week, of course, comes from the great... Well, it comes via, I'm going to say, Machitsky? Machiki. Mech, okay. Um, and it's a quote talking about Sosa and Piontek oh. and the dynamics within the Salernitana yes. camp, where it says, I asked uh, Shistov Piontek if the topic of the Polish national team ever came up in conversation with Paolo Sosa. Turns out, not at all, actually... They didn't even exchange a word with one another. How he is getting chemistry out of this team is mind-blowing. We will see <laughs> you on Monday, guys. Yeah, see you on Monday. Ciao, ciao.